Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of the Sabbath. We thank you for the opportunity to have an audience with the King. As we invite your presence here, Lord, we implore and beg you that you, most importantly, feel welcome here this morning on this Sabbath day to the Lord. Open our hearts to the influence of your spirit. Show us what we need to see. Give us courage to face whatever it is we need to face so that when we leave here, we don't leave the same way we walked in, Father. Give us a transformational experience because of your love and because that is the power of God. Please, Father, speak through me and speak to me that you are glorified and your people are edified this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Deacons, can you please lock the doors? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> you may laugh at that, but I actually typically do say that at the beginning of this presentation, or a presentation related to this presentation, rather, um, because when I was working for the Alberta Conference, I would get often asked to speak on um, cultural identity, teaching children cultural identity. And I traveled in the States and gave that seminar. And typically at the beginning of that seminar, people were always nervous as to what I was going to say. And the first thing I want to start off by saying is that, are we in the house of God this morning? Therefore, do we have anything to fear? Do we have anything to fear? No, we don't, brothers and sisters. The Word of God says that He's given us um, the power of love and of a sound mind, and that casts out all fear. And so we should be encouraged to know that God has something to say to us, even if it's not always the best news, God's, even if it doesn't sound like good news, God's news for us is always encouraging. And so I hope that uh, you'll be blessed as we dive into the subject this morning. Uh, the title is Make Some Noise, and no slides on screen yet? Okay. And so that's being set up. But while that's being set up, um, I start out uh, the, the slides, the first slides you would see, would start off by saying, uh, in about 1895, Ellen White started off with the words, silence is eloquence. Have you heard that statement? Silence is eloquence. But in 2020, if you go downtown to one of the protests that has been taking place, there's another sign, and it says, silence is violence. Have you heard that? That is a statement that is also being made. And so the question for us today is, do we speak up in regards to everything taking place in the world? Is there something we are supposed to say with all of the agitation going on? And I believe that there is, because in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, Solomon says that there is a time to speak and there's a time to be silent. And if you turn with me in your Bibles... To Isaiah chapter 58, you're going to see a moment when God's people are expected to speak. No slides just yet? Okay. We got it? Oh, there we go. Nice. Isaiah chapter 58. Very good. Isaiah chapter 58. Oh. Here we go. Isaiah chapter 58 reads, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. Now, that's not an easy thing for a preacher to do, brothers and sisters, but I believe that the God who has sent this message, as I said before, has encouragement to go with it. And as I'm going to share this morning, because this is such a complex topic, I laid it out in the form of a question and answer. So there's going to be a simple question, then a simple answer, and we'll go through that, and hopefully we can learn some things, because there's some really powerful history, and not only is there powerful history, but there's a beautiful promise at the end that I really want you to catch. So hopefully you're blessed by that. Um, so it says, what's the good news about the Adventist perspective on race and ethnicity? Well... I believe that that starts off right in our Constitution as Seventh-day Adventists. Revelation 14.6 says, And I beheld, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Can you say amen to that? Now what's powerful about this statement 
is that this statement, although it was written almost um, close to about 70 years after uh, Jesus' um, birth, what's amazing about this statement is that this statement applies now more than ever. The three angels' messages applies at the, in the last period of Earth's history, and that was a period uh, right around 1844 when this Earth was charged with racial tensions, right? The Earth was charged, particularly in the United States, the world was charged with racial tensions, and what was amazing is that this message, where the, the, the message is, is being, uh, was written down by John, is, is being applied to every single race, culture, uh, people, and ethnicity kind of letting us know at that time that God is trying to say, listen, the current tensions that you're facing, I knew about them. And I have good news for everybody involved. And so um, I think that's something that, that, that's powerful for us to reflect on. So does God care about race? Well, if you study Adventist history, the person on screen that you're seeing is a guy by the name of William Ellis Foy. Does anybody know who William Foy is? Oh, look, a couple of hands, okay. Well, what's interesting is that before Ellen White showed up on the scene, there was a man by the name of William Ellis Foy, and he received visions that Jesus was coming soon. Now, the interesting thing about William Ellis Foy was that he was not a Caucasian man. He was not a black man. He was a mixed man. And as a mixed man, you had odd treatment in the United States. But he still had this message from God, and he traveled around the United States and delivered this message that God had given him, or these visions that God had given him. And he told people, Jesus is coming soon. And you can actually read his visions on the uh, Ellen White CD-ROM, which is recorded. And him and Ellen White later on met, and he said that they saw the same things. Both her and him sat down and were like, yeah, I saw the same thing too. And they described what heaven looked like, and they were excited as they conversed about what they saw. Now, there was another gentleman by the name of Hazen Foss who rejected the message. That's not this guy. William Foy actually had four visions, and he carried on to do his work that God gave him to do. But what's interesting to me, brothers and sisters, is that the first person to receive miraculous visions was a person who was mixed. God decided to send his Holy Spirit in a place where race was blended, almost in a symbolic fashion to let people know that God is working when human beings come together. Can you say amen to that? And so um, after that realization, oh yeah. See, when technology doesn't work, that's when the Holy Spirit's about to work. That's, that's what I, I realized. So, um, so shortly before 1844, uh, William Ellis Foy has his visions, and then they come to the Great Disappointment. And what's interesting about the Great Disappointment is that 1844 happens and then there's about 50 Adventists left. Most of the people who hear the message, they leave the church. And there's 50 Adventists left and then they're trying to figure out what their doctrines are, what went wrong, why did Jesus not come? And it wasn't until 1863 that the Seventh-day Adventist church was actually formed. Did you know that? So it took another almost 20 years for the church to be formed, right? So what, why, why did that happen? What was the delay? Well, a bunch of things happened, but one of the things Ellen White talks about during that period of time before the church was created was what she describes here. She says, God is punishing this nation for the high crime of slavery. He has the destiny of, nations in his, of the nation in his hands. He will punish the South for the sin of slavery and the North for so long suffering its overreaching and overbearing influences. Now, this is really powerful, friends, because she says that God... In, in, based on the vision she was seeing, was punishing the United States because slavery existed in the United States. And so God is, is in the process of trying to communicate. He's like, I'm not happy with my, my, my sons and daughters who are made in my image being treated the way that they're treated, right? And he's communicating this to Ellen White, and this is happening through the Civil War and many other things. But when you look at the timeline of how everything lays out, we, re, we received the ideas about the Sabbath in 1848, but the church didn't start in 1848. Time still passed until 1863. Now, what was significant that happened in 1863? January 1st, 1863 was the day that the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, or, or went into effect, rather. And so Abraham Lincoln, the President of the United States at the time, he basically wrote down this law that said the slaves are now freed. And it was only after that was done that 170 days, approximately 170 days later, that the Seventh-day Adventist Church was born. 
Let me say that again. God did not create the Seventh-day Adventist church for a 19-year period until the slaves were first freed. Why? That's exactly how it worked in ancient Egypt, brothers and sisters. God did not give his law to his children until they were first released from slavery. Do you remember the timeline? God first rescued his people and he took them out of Egypt and he freed them and he says, I want them to worship me in the wilderness. And then he rescued them and took them out and then he says, now I will make you a new nation. And that's what he did, brothers and sisters. And it's the exact same thing with the Seventh-day Adventist church. God wanted a place where he could preach the full gospel to every single um, person in society. And so he set that up where I believe that God literally waited until the slaves were freed and then he allowed the Seventh-day Adventist church to begin. So it seems like the timing indicates that God cared about what was going on. And as you study through the spirit of prophecy in ancient Advent and old Adventist history, you'll notice that there definitely is a perspective on race, on the race issues, and I believe it's the most accurate perspective. And I believe it is the solution for the majority of problems that we see in the world today. Um, Here's one thing that Spirit of Prophecy says, race is nothing in the sight of God. Christian experience and sanctification through the truth is everything in his estimation. So God did have an opinion. And when I travel and I, and I you know, teach this to kids, one of, the samples that I, one of the examples that I do, and I didn't have time to do it this morning, is you take three boxes. And you have a white box, you have a brown box, and you have a black box. And then you put them down in front of kids and you say, okay kids, which is the gift that you would like to open? And you choose three kids, and then they run up, and they're like, oh, I'll choose that one, I'll choose that one. And they run, and they, they rip open, they grab the, 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 the box. And then I'm like, okay, now you can open them. And then they rip open the boxes, and then they find a chocolate heart inside of the box. And they're like, yeah, chocolate, chocolate. All right, and, so, and then I ask the question, um, which before, actually, before I, I mess it up, before I, I have them open it, I ask them, which box do they think is the best one to take. And they end up saying, just making a guess, and then they all take the boxes, and then they all realize that every single box has a chocolate heart in there. And when I tell them that God is not interested on the outside of the box, he's interested on the inside. What's on the inside? He's interested on the heart. They're like, oh, that's really cute. And I'm like, how much, how much time do you spend focusing on the wrapping paper of your gift? None, right? Because it's just wrapping paper. God is entirely focused on the inside, amen? And so kids, they get it right away, and they're just like, oh, what a beautiful illustration, and they get it. So that was one that I couldn't do this morning, but it's really, it's really easy for us to understand. But for whatever reason, human nature makes it sometimes hard for, it to, for us to understand or because of public tensions. And so back in the days when slavery was a thing, um, when the Advent movement started, the Millerites and after, after the Great Disappointment, most Adventists were abolitionists. Most of the Adventists, they, cont- they tied together the second coming of Jesus along with the, the movement to release the uh, slaves from slavery. And one of the things that Ellen White went on record saying, uh, just how, how much of an abolition, abolitionist she was, she says that the law of the land requiring us to deliver a slave to his master, we are not to obey. And we must abide the consequences of violating this law. The slave is not the property of any man. God is his rightful master, and man has no right to take God's workmanship into his hands and claim him as his own. Interestingly, if you read Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 15, it actually has the exact same law there. It says, if a, if a master has a slave run away, you are not to return the slave back to his master. So this just gives you an idea that most everything that Ellen White was saying comes from the word of God. Amen? And so... Not only that, but John Harvey Kellogg, how many of you guys know who John Harvey Kellogg was? John Harvey Kellogg was uh, the the most prominent Adventist physician at the time, and at one time he was probably the most prominent physician in the world. Uh, Most people don't know that, but he rejected segregation at his sanitarium. He allowed um, blacks and whites to, to, to work together at the sanitarium, and he had fostered 40 children, and some of them were African American. So he had African American kids living in his house, and uh, Latin American kids as well. So what about today? Have we advanced today when it comes to race in the church? Well, I think there's a lot of positive news out there. Some of you have heard of this study, but in 2015, a study was done by the Pew Research Center, and they wanted to look at 
how each religion in the United States relates to race and their concentrations of ethnicities. And so they looked at every single religion, Buddhist, Baptist, Hindu, uh, Methodist, and when they looked at the concentrations across all the different denominations and religions, they, there was one religion that stood out as the most ethnically diverse out of all religions. Do you want to take a guess which religion that was? It's right at the top, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Can somebody say amen to that? This is an independent group, not a church group. They literally looked at us and they said, you guys are the most ethnically diverse people. Why? Because who is our message supposed to go to? Every kindred, nation, tongue, and people. Can you say amen? I love when I come to church and I see a mixture of colors. God likes color. Amen? I don't like it too much when it's all one concentration because I'm like, we need to add some color to the situation, right? And not only that, but I remember, I remember when I was a kid, and, and I used to, uh, well, not when I was a kid, when, when I was back in Montreal, our church was predominantly Caribbean. And so we would go knocking on doors and we'd say, hey, you know, we're at the, we have the local church here. We'd like to offer depression recovery seminars or something. And they're like, which church? And I'm like, the one right on Poirier. And they're like, oh, the black church. And I'm like, no, no, it's not a black church. Anybody can come to our church. And they're like, uh, no, but I see black people going. And I'm like, no, geez Louise. And so it was really bad because I made it uh, my intention to try to incorporate everybody into our church. And so when, I had, when, I, when, when some of my Caucasian friends would come to the church, I'd be like, deacons, we have white gold, white gold. Please <laughs> approach them, make them feel welcome. <laughs> and, and we made sure that everybody felt welcome because that's how the house of God should be, amen? When you see a bunch of people of the same culture all going to church, then you tend to think that, okay, well, that, I have to be part of that culture, or that ethnicity, right? But when you see a diverse group, you realize it's almost like education or the supermarket. Everybody's going there to get something that they actually need. Can you say amen to that? That's what a diverse group of people does. It, it, it sends a testimony that there's more than just a cultural thing going on here. There's something special that transcends how we look and where we're from. And that's the witness that I believe God wants us to have and which is what is happening in the world. Now, has Adventism helped black people? Now, this is really interesting because... There are a lot of unhappy people in the church and a lot of different voices that are saying a lot of negative things. But I want to start off with all the positive and then we're going to work our way to the diff more difficult things. Is that okay? So track with me. Um, one of the most interesting things that I found in, in history is uh, one of the uh, main proponents of civil rights was Malcolm X. He was a bit more aggressive than Martin Luther King, but in his autobiography, I read this as a kid, he mentioned Seventh-day Adventism because his mother was a Seventh-day Adventist. And she actually was a Grenadian-born um, American. And she became Seventh-day Adventist, and he remembers interacting with Adventists. And look at what he says here. He says, we began to go with my mother to be to the Adventist meetings that were held further out in the country, right, the camp meetings. For us children, I know that the major attraction was the good food they served. That's vegetarian food, so he's complimenting veg vegetarian. He, he liked the veggie links, right? Um, <laughs> but we listened to, but we listened to, there were a handful of Negroes from small towns in the area, but I would say that it was 99% white people. The Adventists felt that we were living at the end of time, that the world was soon coming to an end, but they were the friendliest white people I had ever seen. Amen. Can you say amen to that? What if that was the witness for today, brothers and sisters? We were friendly people and our food tastes good. Could you say amen to that? That would be amazing, right? And I think it's possible. We just have to step up to the plate. I think God is calling us to be what we were, right? Because this is where we were. Adventists were always on the cutting edge of being the friendliest, being the nicest, being evangelistic, making the best food, and reaching out to those who were disenfranchised. Um, not only that, but uh, more recently, uh, Loma Linda did some studies and they looked at how black people uh, perform when it comes to their health when they're part of the church. And this is an interesting study. It says there in the study um, that there were health disparities between Caucasians and blacks and Latinos and Asians in the United States. But in the Adventist church, it's not so much there because it says health disparities between black Americans and the rest of the nation have been well docu documented in medical journals. But one study shows that blacks who identify as members of the Seventh-day Adventist church actually report a better quality of life than the average American. 
Researchers point to certain lifestyle behaviors as possible explanation for the difference. Can you say amen to that, brothers and sisters? God's message is healing to, for everybody that takes part of it. And so God didn't just send it just for one group. He sent it once again for everybody. Now, when it comes to influence, this that, that I'm about to show you really, really stopped and hit me. Because when you think of famous Seventh-day Adventists, okay, Adventists that are known in the public, I want you to think about those, those individuals, and, and, and I want you to notice what these people have in common. So who's that on screen? Ben that's Ben Carson. No matter what you think about him, that's Ben Carson, right? That's Dr. Ben Carson. He's, he's, he's uh, the, the head of human uh, health and human, uh, the housing department in uh, the United States, but he's also a neurosurgeon, pediatric neurosurgeon, which is like the hardest uh, type of doctor to, to be. And he was the first person to separate conjoined twins, first man. So that's Ben Carson, a Seventh-day Adventist. Then that is, does anybody know who that is? That's Barry Black. He's the Senate chaplain. He got a little bit of, it got in a little bit of heat for the prayer that he said on the morning when the government was, um, uh, it was on hold. I uh, forget the word. And um, then this guy, does anybody know who he is? His name is Devon Franklin. He's a producer for Sony Pictures. Um, does anybody know who that is? Whitley Phipps. He is very good friends with Bill Clinton and Oprah. Part of uh, the reason why Adventists were able to get into um, Russia at the fall of the Berlin Wall was because Whitley Phipps was closely connected to Bill Clinton. Most people don't know that, but he brings that out. Um, does anybody know who this is? Kevin Alosula. He's a musician who just won a Grammy. He's in a part of a group called Pentatonix. Yeah, Pentatonix. He's the black guy that plays cello and stuff like that. Um, then there was this group called Committed. They won this show called Sing Off. And then this guy here, if you look up, if you type uh, the number one motivational speaker in the world, uh, this guy will come up. Eric Thomas. Has anybody ever heard of Eric Thomas? Okay, just, just a couple. Eric Thomas, he's considered the number one motivational speaker in the world. He is a former Adventist pastor, right? And so you could look him up, Adventist, uh, former Adventist pastor, and he's pretty much um, the number one motivational speaker in the world. He charges, I won't even tell you how much money he charges to, to do one hour of speaking. But now, all these people are Adventists, but what else do you notice in common about them? They're all black men. And so... What hit me, as I, and I, I was talking to, I know some of them personally and had interactions with some of them personally, and what I realized, I was like, this is one of the most marginalized groups in the United States, but these people in Adventism have literally flourished. The message has done something to the point where these are the most well-known Adventists in the world. And it's the black men, the most marginalized group, and I think God did that to help people realize, look at the extent of what the message can do for you in your life. The most marginalized people in one society, when they have my message, they will be the most well-known. I actually wanted to have a, uh, do a documentary. I don't know if you think this is a good idea. I was thinking about doing a documentary where I sit all six of them down and ask them what their experiences were like being brought up in the Seventh-day Adventist church. But that really hit me. And in my own experience, uh, that was the same thing that happened as well. I worked in the entertainment industry, and literally the last role that I had gotten was, uh, was a role that they were going to ask me to work on Sabbaths. And I rejected it because it was on the Sabbath. And they said, okay, we're going to change the entire schedule so you never have to work on Sabbaths. That's when I was working in the inter entertainment industry. And the reason why I, I had those ambitions at the time was because I realized my value because of Jesus. I realized that because Christ's blood was, was shed for me, and the fact that he's asking me to live in these last days of Earth's history for something special, I realize my value. And I realize that I could do anything because of Christ. And so it just pushed me to, 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 to rise higher and to aim higher and to dream bigger and to shoot for bigger things. And so I believe that, that mess, the message does that as well. So now, with all of that said, does that mean that everything is perfect in the church? Everybody in this room said no at the same time. That's really interesting. Hopefully, hopefully Calgary Central is the exception. Maybe this is a perfect church, but I want to tell you the story of Lucy, Lucy Byard. Lucy Byard um, was a person who converted when she was about 25, and she converted in the early 1900s, and um, she joined the Adventist church, started to become a missionary and a Bible worker, 
and she was working full time as a Bible worker, and she, you know, uh, time passed and she, things developed, and she was well known by the church, well loved for how she would cook and stuff like that. And then uh, as time passed, Lucy's first husband passed away, and then she married a second husband, James, James Byard. And as time passed, Lucy developed liver cancer. And so one night in 1943, she attempted to, she wanted to go to the Adventist uh, Sanitarium in Tacoma Park, uh, Maryland. And so because it's predominantly a Caucasian institution, they wrote a letter to a brother Cox who had connections there, and he asked them if she could come in and go to the sanitarium. And the word that got back to Brother Cox was that yes, they could go, but Brother Cox didn't realize that there was a new restriction in Maryland that said basically no colored people were allowed to go to the sanitarium. Now the sanitarium allowed black people to go there only on special occasions. They had to make a special arrangement and they would let them use the basement. And so they tried to make that arrangement. So anyway, Lucy, she started, her liver cancer was getting worse and worse and she was having something called a wasting and she was feeling really bad. So he drove her to the, the sanitarium and when she got there to the doors, they came out and said, oh, we're sorry, Lucy, we can't treat you here. And she's like, I just, I just wanted to get Adventist treatment. I wanted to get the, the natural treatment that we have, which is the better treatment. And they said, unfortunately, because they said yes to her when they saw her name. But when they saw her in person, they said, we, we, can't, we can't allow you to be here. And so they were completely disappointed. The husband said, what do you want us to do? And so they decided they would go to the Friedman Hospital, which was uh, further into town in Maryland, which is a non-Adventist hospital. And she, she was really broken by that. And she went to that hospital, and she died about 38 days later. So she dies about 38 days later, and the word gets out in the community, the Adventist community, about this happening. And everybody is like, why is this happening? Why is this happening? And, and the fervor and the disappointment over this situation begins to build to the point that um, eventually the General Conference, uh, a couple months later, decides to uh, recommend the creation of what they call regional conferences. Does everybody know what a regional conference is here? Okay, some people know. I'll just give you a quick explanation. In the United States, there are conferences called regional conferences, but they're run by uh, African-American Seventh-day Adventists. And so they don't exist in Canada, but in certain states in the United States and different parts of the United States, there are conferences that are entirely um, African-American and Latino or Asian. So it's kind of like minority conferences in some instances. And so they started this so that they could have their own schools, their own sanitariums, and so that there wouldn't be as much friction between um, the believers. Isn't that a sad story? In my heart, I think about that and I'm like, Lord, that is, that is such a difficult thing because Literally, the last prayer of Jesus was, do you remember what the last prayer of Jesus was? John chapter 17, that they would all be one. And Jesus' prayer was spoken verbally in the hearing of the disciples so that they can know that they have the power to answer God's own prayer. He didn't pray that one by himself. He prayed that in their hearing because he's saying a prayer that you can help answer. But unfortunately today, the regional conferences do exist. And um, there's, a, there's an interesting uh, history on that. You can look that up online uh, on Audioverse. There's a very good history about why they still exist and what the steps are to remove them. But this is unfortunately a thing that we have in the church. And this is not God's will. God's will is that we should unify. Listen to this statement and the reason why. It says, there is no person, no nation that is perfect in every habit and thought. One must learn of another. Therefore, God wants different nationalities to mingle together, to be one in judgment, one in purpose. The, then the union that there is in Christ will be exemplified. Can you say amen? amen? So I can learn the hospitality and the cooking skills of my Filipino brethren, right? I can, I can learn that. I can learn the musical talents of my Romanian brethren, right? I can learn from the different cultures because everybody has something to offer and something to give that we can all learn from. And so that's what God wants for us as a church. So then, should we join the protests? How did we work on social, creating social change? Okay, just so I know, how much time do I have? What time are we? Okay, <laughs> okay all right. Um, I want to use an example in the past to show you how we created social change in the past on a different subject the subject of alcohol. 
Now, many may not know this, but originally Adventists were against the sale and the production and the consumption of alcohol. How many of you knew this? They had, they had a movement called the Temperance Movement, and we were actually very, very much against it. I don't know what happened to it. Unfortunately, we kind of dropped the ball on it. Well, I'll show you part of the reason why we dropped the ball, but I want to give you an example about how we fought against alcohol in the early days and look at the results. So Ellen White says this, but of what avail are all our efforts while liquor selling is sustained by law? Must the curse of intemperance forever rest like a blight upon our land? Must it every year sweep like a devouring fire over thousands of happy homes? We talk of the results, tremble at the results, and wonder what we can do with the terrible results, while too often we tolerate and even sanction the cause. Now, small side note, do you know that alcohol probably kills, kills more people than COVID did? Every single year. More people are dying today of alcohol consumption results, drunk driving, you know, cirrhosis of the liver, et cetera, than, than most of the things we're up in arms about, which is interesting. But notice this. She says here, what do we do to fight it? The advocates of temperance fail to do their whole duty unless they exert in their influence by precept and example. By voice and pen and vote in favor of prohibition and total abstinence. We need not expect that God will work to uh, a miracle to bring about this reform and thus remove the necessity for our exertion. We must ourselves grapple with this giant foe. Our motto is no compromise and no cessation of our efforts till victory is granted. So what are the three methods we're supposed to use? By voice, by pen, and by vote. Does that say civil dis dis uh, disturbance? It doesn't say civil disturbance, but it says by voice, by pen, and by vote. So we're supposed to lift our voices and say something. And this is what they did in, the last, in, 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 in that period of time. Now, what were the results of this? Um, well, I'll, I'll, before I get to the results, she says here, we have a work to do along temperance lines beside that of speaking in public. We must present our principles in pamphlets and our papers. We must use every possible means of arousing our people to their duty to get into connection with those who know not truth. The success we have had in missionary work has been fully proportionate to the self-denying, self-sacrificing efforts we have made. So the more we push based on love, the more God will open the doors for us to get things done. And that's what he did for them back then, because you know what happened? Eventually, prohibition was enacted. They actually won the battle. In the United States, in about 1920, alcohol was completely banned in the United States. Those were the prohibition years. So from 1920, up until 1933, all alcohol was banned in the United States because of the movement of the Seventh-day Adventists working alongside with other groups like the Women's uh, Temperance Group. Can you say amen to that? So this is how God wants us to effect social change, by using our voices, by using our pens, by using our votes to change things, right? Unfortunately, um, amazingly, they succeeded, but unfortunately, people, uh, <laughs> as you can see there, People counter-protested, <laughs> and they, uh, they went a little crazy during the Depression, and eventually uh, pro Prohibition ended. And unfortunately, that battle, I guess, we just kind of gave it up after it came back. And, and so here we are today with um, the effect of alcohol. Um, but it ended, but we were successful in that movement. And, and, and I think it's, it's worthy of note to see how we protested, how we affected that change back then, so we can use it as a blueprint for today when we want to affect social change. Um, so is there such a thing as systemic racism? This is a controversial question, right? Is there such a thing as systemic racism? I want to submit to you that the answer to that question is complex, but it's a no and it's a yes. Let me show you why. Civil rights timeline. In Canada and the United States, in 1833, the Slavery Abolition Act was put into place by all British Commonwealth places. So slavery was banned in all of the British Commonwealth, okay, including in Canada in 1833, which is why Canada was the end of the, um, the Underground Railroad for the Americans. They would come up to Canada, Sojourner Truth and many others would bring people to Canada because this was the land, the closest land that was free, right? Um, in 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, and that's when the slaves were technically free. But 
they, it wasn't until 1865 that the 13th Amendment came in at a federal level and made sure it was mandated that all the slaves had to go free. Um, it was about, in, in, I didn't put the, the date there, but it was about 1954 that there was a case, one in the um, Supreme Court of the United States, that ended segregated schools in the United States. Uh, another thing that was taking place is something called redlining, where they were putting, um, forcing black voters into certain places where their vote would have less of an effect, and they would not be a, have access to better education, better public schools, et cetera. That ended in 1968 with the uh, abolition of the, the, the Fair House, with the creation of the Fair Housing Act. Um, then after that, in, there was the Canadian Human Rights Act in 1977. That's where if somebody discriminated against you because of your race, you could uh, basically get an act, uh, you could bring them to the law. Um, the Chart of Human Rights and Freedoms in 1982 made sure all Canadians were equal. And then in 1977, um, Welfare Canada had been sued by a bunch of um, individuals who were minorities who thought they should have had uh, managerial positions, but they felt like their hiring practices and promotion practices were discriminatory, and they actually won this case, and, they, and it was proved that they were discriminatory. So the Canadian government lost in its own human rights tribunal. And so all these things took place, and this is kind of where we are in the civil rights timeline. And I'm bringing this up to say, friends, that for the mo most part, most of the laws are changed today in favor of minorities, as well as the majority. Can you say amen to that? So at least on paper, on the books, the majority of things that have been done protect those who are marginalized, right? Overwhelmingly, right? But then are we free from systemic racism? Well, I'm going to read a statement from Ellen White's writings, and this is written back in 1895, and I want you to... Think of the broad implications of what this statement means. She says here, church members and priests and rulers will combine to organize secret societies to work in their land to whip, imprison, and destroy the lives of the colored race. History will be repeated. She says that people are going to get together in secret societies and potentially get into positions of influence to destroy the lives of the colored people. Now, do we see any of that today? Do we see people in positions of, of, of power kind of you know, uh, using racism um, to, their, to, their, uh, to, to accomplish racism? Well, just this past week, uh, three police officers were fired after they're caught using hate-filled speech, the chief says. And if you go and listen to the recordings, there's these three police officers and they're having conversations and by mistake, they left their recorder on, on their dash cam. And the conversation was being heard where they said, oh, I can't wait to kill all of them because there's gonna be a new civil war and this new civil war is gonna happen and I'm gonna just use it at that opportunity to kill as many N-words as I possibly can. And this is a police officer, the person that's supposed to do what? Protect and serve. So here's the challenge, friends. For the most part, at a systemic level, racism is gone. At the systemic legal level, there's no law that we can go to protest and tell people you have to change this law for the most part. But within positions of the system, there are individuals who are racist. So you have people that are in the system that can dispense with wrong choices or wrong behavior within the system. So the system itself is not bad, but what this does is it lets us know that there are individuals who can still make bad choices and abuse people, right? And they could be in positions of power. So what does this mean? This means then that racism is a sin problem. Amen? Amen. And who deals, with who deals with sin better than the church? Amen? That's why we're here. It's a heart problem. Racism is a heart problem more than a policy problem. There's no law or, or, or thing that we need to march against because it has to do with the human heart, friends. That is the reason why Jesus, when he was alive, he didn't protest against the Roman occupation. Jesus didn't go into the streets and, and start, you know, like tying himself to other, his disciples to stop the moving of mules and stuff like that in and out of Jerusalem. He wasn't trying to protest the Roman occupation, but he was trying to affect the Roman heart because that is what would stop 
the oppression that was taking place. That is the thing that would create lasting effects towards change, friends. Not trying to change some policy. I can change books and laws as much as I want, but if I don't change the heart, it's still going to happen. And this is the thing that most people in the world don't realize. But if, unfortunately, it's starting to happen in the church as well. People in the church are not, are not focused on the fact that it's a heart problem. Racism is just another sin. In fact, in Ellen White's day, you would get disfellowshipped if you were racist. Just like if you stole or if you committed adultery. But we don't do protests for, for, for adultery, do we? Do we have adultery protests? Have you seen that? No, they don't do that, right? Why? Because we all know it's bad, amen? And therefore, we have to focus on the solution, which is in the heart, friends. When Jesus is in the heart, that stuff will have no room to stay there. And so, how do we deal with this? <laughs> okay. Uh, what is the best way to fight against racism? I want... Now, you're looking at this screen and you're seeing something really interesting. You're seeing a black man and he's holding KKK robes in his hands. In my mind, this man that you see on screen is the greatest civil rights leader you've ever met or have ever heard of, and he's still alive today. His name is Daryl Davis. And for me, he is the greatest civil rights leader that has ever lived. Why? Because Daryl Davis didn't speak in huge congregations and huge crowds and have lots of people following him. He didn't protest on the streets. But what he did do was he went into the homes and directly to the faces of over 200 KKK members, shook their hands, became their friends, and convinced them to leave the KKK. To the point that he has 200 of their robes in his house. Can you say amen to that, friends? There's a saying by Abraham Lincoln, have I not destroyed my enemies when I've made them my friends? And when you think about the effect of that, friends, what was Jesus' method in reaching people? Befriending them, amen? He would go to them as one who desired their good. And that's exactly what Daryl Davis has done and is doing, friends. He would go to the skinheads. He would go to the, 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 the people that were totally against him. This is, that doesn't mean that every single skinhead still likes him today. There's people that still dislike him. But he was able to convert the leader of the KKK in many states. And they left the KKK because they met him. And his simple principle was this. He's like, how could you hate me when you don't even know me? And that's what fuels hate, friends. Hate is fueled by ignorance. When you get in contact with somebody else and you get to sit down and you talk to them and you meet them, it's much harder to hate them when you realize how much you have in common with them. And that's literally what he did. Over 200 men. And he's still alive. Nobody heard him. Nobody killed him. Because they realized that humanity is just as there in him as it is in themselves. And so that's the method that I would propose is the best way of addressing racism. And I've actually experienced that. In fact, if you go online, um, if you go online and you look up on YouTube um, neo-Nazis, former neo-Nazis, and you're going to see a whole bunch of stories of people who were former neo-Nazis or former skinheads or former anything like that, and almost 100% of the time, it's because somebody who was of a different ethnicity made friends with them. That's how they got out of it. It's not by being yelled at. It's not by protesting them or counter-protesting them that they ch will change their heart. It's kindness that changes the heart, brothers and sisters. Check out the statement. In your association with others, put yourself in their place. Enter into their feelings, their difficulties, their disappointments, their joys, and their sorrows. Identify yourself with them, and then do to them as were you to exchange places with them. You would wish them to deal with you. This is the true rule of honesty. It is another expression of the law. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Friends, I've been privileged to actually walk people out of racism. On the show that I was working on, the last show that I showed you a picture of, I'm, I was one of the leading actors on that show. And I was being driven home every single, driven to work and driven every day by a driver who would come to pick me up at my house. And unbeknownst to me, one day we had um, to take a detour and drive through the city to get home from the shoot. And as we're driving through the city, the driver, I'll never forget, I won't say his name, but I almost just said it right now. <laughs> 
But he, 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 we, were, we were driving in, in the vehicle, and it was really, really um, busy, and it was like rush hour. And then this little black kid, he runs out in front of us and then kind of flips him off as he runs out in front of him, and he almost hits him. And then he turns to him, and he's like, you stupid N-word. And he forgets that the only person that he was driving that day was the one black guy <laughs> on the set. And so he says that to the kid, and then he looks up at the mirror, and he's like, Namiko, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And I said, hey, look, I understand your anger. And he's like, no, I really am sorry. And he's like, listen, he's like, why do those kids do that? Why do they act so tough and so silly and stuff like that? And I said, yeah, that's, you know, I think every kid in, in any ethnicity acts silly, you know? And he's like, yeah, it's true. And he's like, I got to tell you, Namiko, I, I would have identified as a racist um, up until a short time ago because I've spent this last three months with you and I love you like my son. These were his exact words, I love you like my son, and I can't consider myself a racist anymore. Even though he used that word, having had a chance to connect with somebody to, to realize that love can transcend how we look, it allowed us to connect, and he said, listen, I'm really sorry about what just came out. But he's like, I'm not a racist anymore because of you and the connection we have. And he literally came to my house, after the shoot was done, he drove to my house and he brought me his trucker hat because he was a trucker um, before, a, you know, before we, we, we connected and stuff like that. And the reason why I bring that up, friends, is that it's actually possible to change people's hearts. That's what the message of the gospel says, friends. And it can, it can happen. Most people think that racists are hopeless, but that transformation can actually happen. I've experienced it. Um, so then the next question is, should we join groups like Black Lives Matter? How many of you guys have heard of Black Lives Matter? Okay, now here's the thing. The phrase Black Lives Matter is true, although I prefer the, the phrase Black Lives Matter too. Just a little bit better, right? Black Lives Matter too, I think that's a better phrase, but leave that where it is. But the organization Black Lives Matter, how many of you know about the organization Black Lives Matter? Let's take a little deep dive into the origin and the platform of Black Lives Matter itself. So when you go to their website and you look at what we believe, you see some interesting things. Guiding principles, diversity, okay. Restorative justice, all right. Globalism. Globalism. Queer affirming, okay, interesting. Let's look deeper. When you read their, uh, I think it's the fifth proposal, they say, we disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure requirement by supporting each other as extended families and villages that collectively care for one another, especially our children, to the degree that mothers, parents, and children are comfortable. Who's missing from that list? Exactly, fathers. This is interesting, right? So you're like, um, okay, they want to disrupt the nuclear family which is the core of what we believe in Genesis. Is that something we can agree with? Clearly, we, we can't agree with that because they, want, they don't want the regular two-parent home where children are being raised. And if you read the other part of what they're saying, look at this. It says, we practice empathy. We engage comrades with the intent to learn about and connect with their context. Their, their, excuse me, their context. Comrades. Where, where, where does that phrase come from? Comrades, right? Exactly. It comes from socialism. Well, I'm going to show you a little video with an interview of one of the founders of Black Lives Matter, and I want you to listen to what they're saying. You, you don't know audio? Can you... Okay, well, uh, uh, while they're setting it up, um, I'll just give you a little bit of background information. So this is an interview of one of the Black Lives Matter's leaders, founders, okay? And what's interesting about this interview that you're about to hear is um, there was somebody in the black community that was kind of criticizing them, saying, we don't know what your platform is, we don't know what you're aiming for, 
right? Because you're, you're, you're mobilizing, but we don't know what you're trying to accomplish and ask for, okay? So listen to this, the, the, the question and listen to her response because Black Lives Matter was started by three women, three black women. You ready? He was concerned or is concerned that, uh, that there's a lack of perhaps uh, uh, ideological direction in Black Lives Matter that would allow it to be, to, to, to fizzle out, in, as he said, um, uh, in comparison to Occupy Wall Street. Uh, as you are, are advanced in your own organization, as you all are headed to Cleveland to participate in this Black Lives um, Movement conference, how do you respond to that particular critique? Again, a loving critique from an elder of the struggle uh, that some others share, uh, that I've even shared as well, to, to be frank, as a concern about, uh, in part because of the co-optation and, and the appropriation, that, that a, a, a more clear ideological um, structuring might be of some value here. But how do you respond to, to, to those kinds of, uh, again, loving criticisms? Um, I think that the criticism is helpful. Um, I also think that it might, um, I think of a lot of things. The first thing I think is that we actually do have an ideological frame. Um, myself and Alicia in particular are trained organizers. Um, we uh, are trained Marxists. Um, we are uh, super uh, versed um, on sort of ideological theories. Did you catch that? She said we are trained Marxists. In other words, they're not proponents of Marxism. They're adherents of Marxism. So who's Karl Marx? I want to show you really quickly some of the things that Karl Marx believed. If you don't know, if you've never heard of Karl Marx, he was a German philosopher, and he's basically the father of communism, right? Now, here's, here's some of the things that he said, okay? And things, some of the things, when we talk about what's compatible with communism, I want you to re read, check out what he says on screen. What was Karl Marx's opinion of religion? He called religion the opiate of the masses. In other words, he called religion the drug of the masses. He says the first requisite of the happiness of the people is the abolition of religion. So his whole thing was we gotta get rid of religion. We gotta, if people wanna be happy, we have to destroy religion. He also says communism abolishes eternal truths and it abolishes all religion and all morality. Does that sound like something we can get behind as Christians, <laughs> right? And then this is where it gets even more interesting because Black Lives Matter, they're in favor of this Marxist person, but Marx, was racist. Look at what Marx says here. In his writings, he wrote, Tremont proved that the common Negro type is the degenerate form of a much higher one, a very significant advance over Darwin. He also said, without slavery, North America, the most progressive of countries, would be transformed into a patriarchal country. Wipe out North America from the map and the, of the world, and you have, will have anarchy, the complete decay of modern commerce and civilization. Abolish slavery and you will have wiped America off the map of nations. Is that, is that, does that sound like Black Lives Matter to him? <laughs> right? So in other words, this ladies, these ladies are following this stuff, but they're blending it with a dude who didn't even like black people. Do you understand the confusion? Which is why we as Seventh-day Adventists don't need to blend with that stuff. We have our own voice and our own message. Can you say amen to that? And it actually solves problems. Because what they're proposing, this globalism and all this other stuff, is going to bring more problems to the world. I'm going to say that again. What they are proposing and what they want to accomplish will bring more problems to the world. Actually, it's going to bring the end of the world. And this is why this is so serious. The fact that this movement has exploded around the world makes me question, how did it, we were all caught up in COVID. You ever notice how like COVID was the big thing? And it was, oh, COVID, COVID, COVID. Then all of a sudden, you know, then you're like watching TV and then somebody changes the channel. And you're like, hey, I was just watching that. That's how my life felt. I, was, I felt like, oh, I'm watching COVID. And then boom, they just changed to protests. And I'm like, what, 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 why is this globally happening? Why is this taking place globally? Well, take a look. One of the persons who support Black Lives Matter, they're calling now for the removal of the statues. Have you heard of that? And they want a removal of, of, of the white Jesus. Now what's really funny is that a lot of the statues don't even have color. They're just like bronze or all black 
and they want to remove the statues of white Jesus, right? And I'm like, that's very interesting because that goes along with this communist manifesto, right? So where is this all headed? Ellen White sums it up, and she tells you where this is headed, friends. She says, anarchy is seeking to sweep away all law, not only divine, but human. The centralizing of wealth and power, the vast combinations for the enriching of the few at the expense of the many, the combinations of the poorer classes for the defense of their interests and claims, the spirit of unrest, of riot and bloodshed, the worldwide dissemination of the same teachings that led to the French Revolution are all tending to involve the whole world in a struggle similar to that which convulsed France. Such are the influences to be met by the youth of today. To stand amidst such upheavals, they are, uh, they are now to lay the foundations of character. Marx, in his own writings, took many of the principles from the French Reformation to form his own opinions. Marx saw the French Revolution as a good thing, principally. And so she says those principles and those ideas are what is going to help bring the end of the world. Now, if you didn't get it, this is the cover of... Uh, the Rolling Stone magazine, the most recent Rolling Stone. And I don't know if you notice the similarity, but this is the picture painted of um, the French Revolution. It's called Lady Liberty Leads, or something to that effect. And the idea is that Rolling Stone is basically saying we're creating a new French Revolution. Now, some of you, somebody on the, online or somewhere is going to be like, oh, conspiracy theorists, conspiracy theorists. It's not conspiracy, friends. The artist literally tried to communicate this idea. And so this is significant that we realize where this is, these movements are all headed as Christians and what the solution is. Um, I want to spend a couple more minutes underscoring this point because it's really, really important. God is not a fan of communism. And I'm going to read for you some specifics as to why. Many urge with great enthusiasm that all men should have an equal share in temporal blessings. But this was not the purpose of the Creator. A diversity of condition is one of the means by which God designs to develop character. He intends that those who have worldly possessions shall regard themselves as stewards of his goods, entrusted to be employed for the benefit of the needy. It would be the greatest misfortune that has ever befallen mankind if all were to be placed upon an equality in worldly possessions. Every single time you've seen socialism and communism around this world, what, what have you also seen? Basically, genocide. Almost every single place. I have friends who, who grew up in Romania, and they would tell me, Namiko, the bread lines. You would, you, would see, you would see an empty store, and I had to wake up at like 5 o'clock in the morning, go to the bread line, and then there's like 1,000 people all scrunched up in front of this store that's empty, and they're all looking at the one bread truck coming to deliver bread. And that one truck would come behind and deliver the bread, and then the people, the people who own the store would take some bread for their own families and stash some bread away, and then they would put a little bit of bread into the store, and then a thousand people would push down in, in, into the store to try to get the money, uh, to, to get the little bit of bread that was there. She's like, you do not want communism. It's happened in, in China, in Russia, uh, many other places where communism takes place. These, these ideas are antithetical to the gospel. Um, it says here, it was never God's purpose that society should be separated into classes, that there should be an alienation between the rich and the poor, the high and the low, the learned and the unlearned. But the practice of separating society into distinct circles is becoming more and more decided. Have you noticed that? People are trying to adapt, um, adhere to different identities, identitarianism, saying, I'm part of this group, I'm part of this group, I'm part of this group, or you're this group. Don't call me that group. And God is saying, you're all my children. That's all that matters. There's no different sections of heaven. Can you say amen? There's only one heaven, and that's where we're all going. And, and, she, and she's saying all of this stuff is happening is causing more friction than is causing unity. And God is not with this stuff because it's helping to bring the end of the world, friends. And particularly when it comes to, to, to that last one, the, the, the class between the differentiation between the rich and the poor. Do you know what, when social scientists study the human uh, families and stuff like that, they wanted to know what was the greatest predictor of success, financial success for families, and you know what it was? When a person was, when a child was raised in a home where the parents waited until marriage to have their children, that was the greatest predictor of success for any single race. Did you know that? That is the greatest predictor for financial success. If you have kids, 
and you married, you, if you waited till you married, excuse me, if you waited till you were married to have your children, and then you had children and you raised them in a two-parent home, that is the greatest predictor of financial success. And that, that's built into the package. Can you say amen? That's the instruction that God gave us. And so, what is the external solution for all of these tensions? Well, there's a couple things. Now, I'm going to read a statement, and I'm, I won't elaborate on it, but you can come and ask me after what I think this statement is what's the best way to apply the statement. But this is what she says when it comes to the black race, because we can see that in the United States, there are marginalized people and other minorities as well, and they need help. I'll read the statement, then I'll, I'll move on. But she says here, the American nation owes a debt of love to the colored race, and God has ordained that they should make restitution for the wrong which uh, they have done them in the past. Those who have taken no active part in enforcing slavery upon the colored people are not relieved from the responsibility of making special efforts to remove, as far as possible, the sure result of their enslavement. So there's still effects, and there's still something for us to do. And the government has something to do. And she also, in another place, says that the government and the churches have something to do. What is the recommendation there? I won't get into that right now, but there is something that I believe that the government and the churches could do. But what is the solution for all of these tensions? The good news is that it says here, when the Holy Spirit is poured out, there will be a triumph of humanity over prejudice in seeking the salvation of souls of human beings. God will control minds, human hearts will love as Christ loved, and the color line will be regarded by many very differently from the way in which it is now regarded. To love as Christ loves lifts the mind into a pure, heavenly, unselfish atmosphere. So what can we do now? Here is the hidden solution, friends. I want to give you a very quick explanation of why I believe this is so important. Isaiah 58 is the most quoted passage in all of Ellen White's writings. Did you know that? It is the most quoted passage in all of Ellen White's writings, and what she says here is the whole of 58th chapter of Isaiah is to be regarded as a message for this time to be given over and over again. Well, you know about the first verse. We read it. It says, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. We're about to wrap up. But there's something deep that takes place in this chapter that most people don't realize. It goes on to say, why have we fasted, say they, and you see not? Why are you not answering our prayers? Why have we not experienced spiritual success in our, in our churches? And you fast for strife and debate, and you smite with the fist of wickedness. Well, there's something interesting taking place in these verses. When you look at the depth of the text, it says, behold, in the day of your fast, so there's a specific fast, and it says, is this the fast that I have chosen? It's a fast that God has chosen, and it's a day for a man to afflict his soul, and it's a day that's supposed to be acceptable to the Lord. What is that day that a man was supposed to afflict his soul? In the Old Testament, there's only one day that a man was supposed to afflict his soul. Leviticus 23 tells you that it's the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement was the day that you were supposed to fast and afflict your soul. That's the only day in all of the Bible. So Isaiah 58 is talking about the Day of Atonement, brothers and sisters. And what are we living in as Seventh-day Adventists? We're living in the antitypical Day of Atonement. Stay with me, okay? There's more significance to it. So here's the thing. In ancient Israel, there was something special called the Jubilee. How many of you have ever heard of the Jubilee? When there was a financial imbalance or there was a, a, a disruption in society, every, single, every 50 years, there was this thing called the Jubilee, where if you had lost all of your money, if you had made bad financial decisions, every 50 years, there was basically a reset. And you got to go back to the property that your family had owned 50 years previous. And if you were a slave, you were allowed to go free. If you were oppressed, you were allowed to, to break that oppression. So this happened every single 50 years, and it was the means of, by which uh, Israel didn't have people that were ridiculously, ridiculously rich and people that were ridiculously, ridiculously poor. It balanced everything out. The Jubilee balanced everything out. Now here's the thing, friends. Jesus fulfills every single feast, but do you know when the Jubilee began? The Jubilee always begins in a specific time. It says... And then thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years, and the space of seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Then thou shalt cause the what? 
trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the what? Tenth day of the seventh month, going further down, then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month, in the what? Day of atonement shall the trumpet sound, shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. Are you seeing the connection, friends? <laughs> Very not seeing it, so I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to try to make, because I want, I want to wrap up on this point, because it's really critical that you get this. How does Isaiah 58 start off? He says, cry aloud, lift up your voice like a? In the Day of Atonement. The only time that trumpets blew in the Day of Atonement was what? On the Jubilee. Isaiah is trying to say call for the Jubilee because that is the end to your problems. Call for the Jubilee because that is where God is going to solve all the issues that you're facing right now, your irrelevance. And it starts by when you reach out to those around you in kindness. The jubilee for us, brothers and sisters, antitypically though, it means the end of time. And it happens in the Day of Atonement. Look at this last statement I'll read. Ellen White says, Then commence the what? Jubilee, when the land should rest. I saw the pious slave rise in triumph and victory and shake off the chains that bound him while his wicked master was in confusion and knew not what to do. For the wicked could not understand the words of the voice of God. Soon appeared the great white cloud. Friends, what it's saying here is that our antitypical jubilee starts off when we start to raise our voices like a trumpet. Saying what? Saying to each other, how can I help you, my brother and my sister? What is the issue that you're facing? It starts when we lift our voice. If you, I'm not going to read through all of Isaiah chapter 58 right now, but it says you have to break every yoke and let the oppressed go free. So around us as Christians, brothers and sisters, we have to look at those who are oppressed or who are feeling offended or who are feeling downcast by the treatment that they're getting. If you're a Caucasian person and you see somebody being racist to somebody else of a different ethnicity, God is calling you to lift up your voice. If you're a black person and you see another black person being racist to an, a, a Caucasian person, you need to lift up your voice. All of us, when we see unrighteous things going on, need to lift up our voice because that is what is going to bring, according to the text, the Jubilee friends. As we extend kindness to each other and lift up our voices, Jesus says that's going to be the spirit that will allow him to come because we're reflecting his image in ourselves. So that's my message for today, friends. God is calling us to make some noise, but it's to make some righteous noise. Can you say amen? amen. Speak about the good things that we can do and take the opportunity to when you see something wrong being done, stop that wrong thing because that jubilee is about to begin and we're about to be free. If you felt convicted that maybe you've seen something take place and you haven't spoken up, I'm asking everyone here to bow your heads with me. And if that's you, that you wish you would have spoken up when something wrong was being done, I'm simply asking you to raise your hand. And if you're saying that I want to speak up for kindness, to show love in situations where it's needed, I'm asking you to raise your hand as well. God bless you. I'm going to pray now. And as we think about what we can do as individuals to help cry out and raise our voices for this jubilee to take place, I just want us to reflect on the fact that this is not something for the, the, the far future. This is right now. God needs us to make these choices right now because it's coming as soon. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness, your grace, your mercy, your love. And I pray that your spirit would just descend upon your people as you did in ancient times, Father. Lord, our hearts are open. And I pray in a special way that it, not because of the speaker, but in spite of the speaker, your spirit would just be here and help us to realize we have a part in raising our voices like a trumpet, dear God, to call for this jubilee, to call for this rebalancing, to, to call for the freedom of everyone that is feeling uh, oppressed. Lord, we pray for the Holy Spirit 
so that we can look at each other with the eyes that Jesus looked at us with. Move upon us as a people, dear God, so that we can right any wrongs that remain wrong. And so that we can transform into the full image of Jesus and bless this world to show them that it's actually possible to overcome these issues that are facing society. Lord, if these are not fixed in the church, they will not be fixed in the world. We don't want to see the stones cry out because they're not supposed to cry out, dear God. They weren't given mouths, but we were given mouths. And we were given your spirit to speak. So give us the courage, give us the hearts, give us the love to do that you ask us to do, dear God. Bless everyone here, and I pray everybody watching on stream receives the Holy Spirit as well, dear God, and those that are praying. And help us to move forward in unity, dear God. Not afraid of the future, because we know that you're with us even to the end of the world. Thank you so much for your love, your kindness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So much more to say on this subject and related subjects, but we're going to end it here. And I just pray that as we see all the different things happening and then leading to the end of the world, that we realize that God is calling us to make a full-on commitment, not just half of our hearts, but all of our hearts. God bless you. God loves you. So do I.